Hi, this is Tim Gonzo Gordon. And I'm Roger Pike. And why are you so low, Roger? You found you feel, feel like you're a long ways away. What's what's going on? I here? have no idea. Am I louder now? Oh, that works. You're, you're closer <laughs> to the microphone. You know, this is going to be a little bit different uh, episode of our podcast. We decided that we would sort of wing it, but uh, we sort of have a sketch of where we're going. Uh, yeah, I mean, we had some ideas about some communications tips that we could pass along. I mean, we could talk about the power of the story or alliteration or using powerful adverbs or adjectives, and all of those things would be good tips, but not today. today? Yeah, uh, yeah, we usually will sort of have an idea of what we're going to talk about. We'll, we'll take a subject and dig into it for eight or ten minutes, but today we're really going to talk about sort of communication in general, and then some other things would just sort of come to mind. Now, communication to me, you know, I really thought about this uh, uh, a couple of months ago and wrote some notes on it, and I thought in a sort of a broad sense, the world does not exist without communication. I mean, the sun is communicating to us by by sending us light. That's a type of communication. The world communicates to us by offering us a place to live. I mean, a skunk communicates to us by telling us to stay the heck away. <laughs> well, that's true. Animals communicate to us. Uh, there musicians. is no way. You said musicians earlier. Musicians, yeah. There's no way to communicate, uh, to, to live in this world without some sort of communication t- taking place. Uh, for instance, you can walk down the street and see somebody, and they're communicating to you how they feel by their body language. And you can non-verbal. sense that because and if I you. I wanted th- to talk about nonverbal communication in just a second, but I wanted to ask you a question first. Okay. You think communication is important. So tell me. Who are your favorite communicators? My favorite communicators. You know, I, it's funny because I, I think of public speakers, and, and uh, I, I'm probably going to mention a couple of people that you would mention. Obviously, when I was a, a youngster, I thought John F. Kennedy was mm-hmm. was a great public speaker. Uh, I've seen a lot of great public speakers. Uh, like Les Brown comes to mind. He was really uh, interesting to watch, a uh, motivational speaker. Tony Robbins, I really enjoyed uh, seeing him talk one time. Uh, very powerful, dynamic, exuberant, enthusiastic, energetic, and knew what he was talking about. And that's really what it boils down to. You know, do you know what you're talking about? And then because I grew up with music being such an important part of my life, I look at some of the great communicators in music. You know, you have Tom Petty and Bob Dylan and John Lennon. You just go on and on. The list is, is very huge for what, and I think those are all great poets, great communicators. They, they communicate with music. They communicate by the way they sing, the style they, they sing in. Uh, what they say. What about you? Well, John Kennedy, of course. I mean, I grew up with him, too. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, of course, uh, I wasn't born until after World War II was over. When I was learning to be a public speaker, I went to the library and checked out records. Uh, and among them were, were Churchill speeches, and they were just, uh, no one rallied a nation the way that he was able to uh, picture the, those dark days when the buzz bombs were coming over and the blitz, and there were German planes in the skies every night, and there were blackouts, and bombs were falling on your houses, and and yet he rallied that nation with the power of his oratory. So he was great. Great novelists. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Ernest Hemingway. A fabulous communicator. John Steinbeck is one of my favorite writers. And yeah. it was only in the last uh, probably five or six years that I actually have paid attention to what his writing was. But his, you know, these writers are timeless and their message is, is great. Such a, And, you know, you can go from one extreme to the other. I mean, I like Ernest Hemingway, his spare use of language, his ability to uh, paint vivid word pic- pictures in very few words and then con- convey great ideas. Uh, in a in a simple and spare style, and then you can go directly 180 degrees differently and talk about uh, other great writers who were so dense in their language. Uh, uh, there's a writer, uh, uh, an Argentinian writer named Jorge Luis Borges, mm-hmm. whose writing is very dense and very layered, and and you have to really dig into it in order to understand it. And I think he's a great communicator too. One of my favorite novelists is uh, Martin Cruz Smith, who wrote uh, Gorky Park, and five or six other novels that I've read of the same character, uh, Arkady Renko, uh, which in the movie, of course, was played by William Hurt. Uh, great storytelling. I, well, I grew up reading science fiction. I mean, my favorite writers back then and probably when I was a teenager and, and beyond uh, was Philip K. Dick, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, uh, Frederick Pohl, I mean, uh, Ray Bradbury. These guys are what I grew up on, was listening to that. And interestingly Robert enough, Hanlon. I I used to buy comic books like crazy when I was 8, 9, 10 years old. Yeah, I did too. And my parents would go, what are you spending your money on? I said, but I'm reading. Don't you get it? I'm reading. <laughs> yeah. So, And that that was actually what convinced them, that it was okay for me to spend my allowance on a 12-cent or a 15-cent comic book. Well, I want to go back to something that you said earlier in keeping with this eclectic edition uh, of our podcast, and that was the idea of nonverbal communication. And I don't think it's something that we've – 
paid enough attention to in our podcast, and maybe we should devote a whole one to it one of these days. But I read, uh, not uh, you know, when I was in college and studying communication, that something like sixty percent of social communication happens nonverbally: a facial expression, a tone of voice, a lift of an eyebrow, uh, not words, yeah. but just the things that you that that people people do that sets a mood gives a climate uh either says uh yes you're you interest me or yes. or, or no i have no interest in well you, you go into a Get busy bar face. and you see someone across the bar uh you obviously can if you catch their eye and they you know catch your eye and they're interested in finding out more about you you can communicate a lot in just a couple of looks, boy, it's just amazing what you can pick up. Yeah, and and you know, sometimes I think that too much is made out of trying to read nonverbal cues. I mean, there was a, a book that came out, Nonverbal Communication and Human Interaction, that basically said that you can tell everything there is to know about a person, or at least about their interest in you, or something like that, by reading their nonverbal cues. And sometimes I think that that's all wet. I mean, a- after all, I mean, if you're talking to a woman and she has her arms crossed over her chest, that's supposed to be a sign of being closed in yes. and uninterested. Uh-huh. It might also be a sign that she's chilly. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can make too much of that stuff. But there's a lot you can read in that. You can there watch is. somebody walking down the street, and if they're kind of slow and shuffling and their shoulders are forward, they're they're not in a great mood. They are they're, they could be depressed or not feeling too well. But you see a guy walking exuberantly, and uh, you know there's a lot of different ways you can read emotion, and you don't even think about it because it's pretty subconscious. But you can tell. Uh, you know, Obviously, when, you, when you've been married or in a relationship for a long time, you can read your spouse's body language like that. Yeah, my spouse's body language is so easy to read. Usually it involves a rolling pin in my head. And I'm sure she can read yours too, Roger. Uh, what else do we want to talk about before well, we wrap know, it up? We've got a couple of minutes. I think that it's important to get a sense of who we are so that you can understand what the podcast is about. And, and I think that, that to some extent we've, we've done that. You know, we want to talk about why communication matters to us. It matters to you because of the way that you became involved with music. And, and that uh, and then became uh, not just a musician, but a purveyor of music. Yeah, I was a, a disc jockey for You're many, many years, and, music director. So music was such a big part of your life, and that form of communication was such a big part of your life. For me, it was public speaking. I mean, I put myself through college on public speaking and debate scholarships. And sure. That became such a huge part of my life. But that's why communication came to matter to us. And I thought of a phrase recently that I liked and I wanted to share, and that is, communication is the magic by which thought becomes action. I believe that, and, and that's why, why we're doing Communication is the... Magic by which thought becomes action it becomes action. Is that your quote? That's me. Are you, are you quoting yourself? I'm going to put that on my wall. I like that. <laughs> uh, I think you should quote yourself. We should all quote ourselves. We should all quote ourselves. Go back through stuff you've written. Quote yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good. It feels good, Roger. This has been a great little uh, discussion on communication, and we'll wrap up our podcast now, and we'll talk to you next week.